Hello, I'm President Tom Katsuleas. Welcome to the world premiere of Completely Connecticut Agriculture. This documentary film created by three Yukon students and a Yukon Extension staff member is a dynamic and creative introduction to agriculture in Connecticut. In particular, this film does three things. First, it showcases sustainability. It shows how Connecticut farmers are producing a sustainable food supply through environmentally responsible methods. Second, it uses the power of film to connect consumers to the unusually innovative agriculture of the state. Finally, it shows some of the interesting products of Connecticut farms that are every bit as unique as our state itself. Agriculture has been central to Yukon's mission for 140 years, and as Connecticut's land-grant university, it's a commitment we take very seriously. These filmmakers have done Yukon proud and created something of value for farmers and the consumers they benefit all across our state. So sit back, enjoy the film, and when it's over, make sure you take the opportunity to explore all the Connecticut agriculture has to offer. My name is Indrajit Chaube. I am Dean of the Yukon College of Agriculture, Health and Natural Resources. Welcome to the screening of Completely Connecticut Agriculture. Agriculture is an important economic engine in the state as it contributes to more than $4 billion in revenues and supports more than 21,000 jobs. However, many consumers are not familiar with agriculture and food production in Connecticut, as many of them are removed by several generations from the farm. In this documentary, three of our undergraduate students, Jack Duda, Jonathan Russo, and Alison Snyder, are trying to bridge this communication gap between consumers and Connecticut agriculture by showcasing everyday innovation that happens on our farms. I want to thank Office of Vice President for Research for providing funding through the IDEA grant. This IDEA grant enabled our students to convert their dream into reality of bringing information about Connecticut agriculture to a broader audience. And this experience has been truly life transformational to them. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the documentary. Hi, I'm Zach. I'm Allie. I'm John. We formally met each other in 2017. Where we served together as Connecticut FFA state officers. We all shared a burning passion for agriculture. And that's where our friendship began. We traveled the state, inspiring agricultural students to speak for themselves. Showing them how to speak out and advocate for the agricultural industry, teaching them to vocalize for those who could not. This project is a continuation of our work. Our work to inspire people with the tales of agricultural innovation. To show the world the amazing people of our industry. So that our farmers across Connecticut get the credit that they deserve. This is Complete Connecticut Agriculture. Since we were children, we've all been taught to leave things cleaner and better than the way we found them. And with this rule, our planet can be no exception. Our industrialization has led to progress as a species, but it has also culminated in environmental degradation and biodiversity loss. Two huge challenges facing agriculture today. With the human population, expected to surpass 9 billion people by 2050, we need to figure out how to craft a more sustainable food supply, all the while keeping a watchful eye on our planet's environment, habitats, and ecosystems. Although we have many obstacles to overcome in this endeavor, it can be safely said that our farmers and ranchers have been making progress and taking action with practices such as no-till, drip irrigation, integrated pest management, and cover cropping, our producers are helping regenerate the soil and provide biodiversity to their agricultural systems. Our producers here in the Constitution State are stewards of the land and are helping craft a more sustainable food supply for future generations. As we begin our journey, 
and head to the Connecticut River Valley, we must remember the role agriculture plays in the history of the Constitution State. Farmington, after all, got its name for a reason. A reason why Roger and Isabel Phillips seek to keep Subedge Farm a traditional and impactful place in their community. We came to Subedge Farm to see the sustainable practices they are implementing here and learn more about the food system they are creating for the communities around them. I'm Roger Phillips. I am the co-owner of Subedge Farm in Farmington and Avon, Connecticut. We grow certified organic fruits, vegetables, culinary herbs, flowers, and raise pasture-raised beef, chicken, eggs. You know, we had kids and we wanted to give them the best possible, cleanest possible food that we could. And uh, one of the ways we thought about doing this is growing it ourselves. I ended up looking at a, an urban farm in New Britain and uh, sort of asked one day if I could get a part-time job there. Walked in, they hired me, walked in there, and then um, I, uh, I loved it. Never turned back. In the 1930s, DNA Pope Riddle was a, a famous female architect. She owned this farm. She owned 5,000 acres here, and she managed it as a working farm alongside of her school, Avon Old Farm School, which we were. And it was, back then it was progressive in that, um, you know, she was growing all the food for the school. So about the beef and the potatoes and the carrots and, you know, the eggs and the pork, everything was from here. Um, so her name for the farm was Subedge Farm. And so when we took over the place, we were kind of looking back at the history of it and said, this is a really cool name. We wanted to respect the history of the place, so we kind of brought that back. Um, we definitely wanted to be a community-oriented farm, so community-supported agriculture is like kind of like the perfect model for that, where members of the community and families can really become a part of the farm by investing financially. The CSA allowed us to you know, take something from the community and then give it back that season. And then we also uh, give a portion of the food that we grow to local food banks as well. That's an important part of it experience the last 20 years, uh, you know, where we used to have to drive quite a distance to be able to find some nice organic produce or grass fed beef. And now it's not as hard as it used to be. It, it just gets more and more local. So you have your corner, you know, your, your neighborhood farm, or your neighborhood grocery, your neighborhood baker, your neighborhood butcher, that kind of thing. That's what I would like to see more, more of that happen. And I also think we should look at maybe a more of a regional outlook like all of New England and New York, like how can we these regions work together to create a local food system? So we are certified organic. We are um, certified organic farm. Our vegetables, flowers, fruits, culinary herbs, our pasture and hay are all organic. The basic idea that care in the soil is the most important thing um, as, as farmers, we're stewards and making sure that we're doing things like um, growing cover crops or you know not polluting the waterways, all of those things are sort of central to organic. And that's what we wanted to do from the start. So we knew right away that we wanted to be certified organic to express like this is important to us, this is what we believe in. So there's a lot more hand weeding, there's a lot more people power involved. But for us, we think that's good. You know, we want people on the farm. We want to employ people. At, when we started, it was really Isabel and I doing kind of everything. The first two years were very difficult. We were like working. All, all day, all, all the time, you know, out of a tractor in the dark kind of thing. And so as we started to grow, one of the big things that's changed is we've had, been lucky to have such an amazing staff join us. We've been able to find excellent people who we can trust completely. So we have Alex, who's our livestock manager. We have Aaron, who's our field manager. We have Sab, who's our harvest manager. And though that trio really, you know, like, it's sort of been a growth step to be able to let go a little bit and trust these people to, to take care of business and they've done an outstanding job. We do a lot of poultry, so we do a lot of pasture-based poultry and that includes meat birds, it includes laying hens, Thanksgiving turkeys that we do. So we have 750 layers that we do a year and um, we do about 120 meat birds every two weeks and um, we have about 200 or so 
Thanksgiving turkeys. So that's sort of we raise grass fed beef. They're on they're on the pasture in the, in the summer and then we raise hay and uh, feed them the hay during the, the winter. And um, we also do raise some forest raise work, so we raise about uh, 16 uh, hogs a year. And like I said, pasture based, meaning that they spend almost their entire life out on the grass. They're scratching around, getting a lot of their diet from actually from the pasture and the bugs that they're eating, supplementing with grain, and of course, clean, clean water. And so, like Joel Salazar says, it's a, it's polyculture. So there's many different things happening at once, and it's almost like it's a it's a dance, you know, it's like a, that comes together and everything works in harmony. So our livestock and our animals, um, you know, like I said, sometimes our vegetable scraps are going to go to the pigs um, or the chickens, and then the chickens are fertilized in the fields that in two years are going to be vegetable fields. Um, as far as like uh, what kind of marketing you want to be able to do, Our journey continues as we visit the quiet corner of Connecticut in a small town called Putnam. Being sustainable and economically viable should be every farm's goal, and Yoko Takimara and Alex Carpenter definitely show that it is possible. We wanted to visit Asawaga Farm to better understand the concept of hand-powered agriculture and catch soil sustainability at work. It's unbelievable what can happen on less than an acre of land. Hi, I'm Alex from Osawaga Farm. And I'm Yoko. <laughs> um, we're a three-quarter acre uh, certified organic no-till farm located in Putnam, Connecticut. We specialize in Japanese varieties of vegetables. Both of us were in, I guess, more techie fields before this. I was an electronic engineer and Yoko was a consultant. I, I wasn't certain what I wanted to do when I got into grad school and food definitely caught my attention so I tried to do a lot of classes you know related to agriculture sustainable agriculture and I grew up you know in huge cities my whole life I'm originally from Tokyo and so and I just never had a chance to you know come across a farm or even really go like you know that would be I yeah, I just never had those kind of opportunities, so that was like my first big sort of introduction to it, and I just couldn't take my mind off of like that, you know, possibility of working on a farm and becoming a farmer. But I think it's kind of it was kind of a big leap. Um, a lot of people start off kind of start you know start off having a part time job and then doing a little bit of the farming, but we quit our full time jobs at the same time and like jumped in to doing this full time so that was kind of you know something that people ask about and like they want to know if it's a viable thing and I guess my answer is like it's absolutely viable yeah so as you can see our farm is really small it's on three quarters of an acre we plant things very intensively so we're able to pack in a lot of vegetables in a small amount of space um, so each bed gets you know, obviously at least one crop but up to three crops in a season so yeah we do get a lot out we also do a lot of cover cropping which might be a little bit less common on a small farm but we try to get as much cover cropping in as possible to keep the ground covered with living roots and we also try to cover our beds with mulch even if there are plants growing so that you know every part of the soil is covered and we really have an emphasis on soil health so it's really just trying to um, just keep a really healthy population of microbes and bacteria and fungi in our soil. So that's our really, you know, it's our main goal in farming. So we are no-till, meaning we don't till our soil at all. Um, but if you think about what a tiller does when it goes to the soil, you've got a piece of metal spinning at a very high RPM and earthworms, fungi, any living micro or macro um, organism in the soil is going to be disturbed, if not just killed. Um, but for us, hand-powered, it's, it's just a much more gentle way of interacting with nature. Um, it's a way of keeping the soil biology high. And also, you know, a lot of the bigger farms, the 
Their size, their scale is constrained by the tractors that they use. They need to have certain buffers around their fields to turn the tractor around. Their beds have to be a certain size so that the tractor straddles it. With us, we can pack in so much into a very small space. So we have 30 inch beds, 12 inch pathways between it. Just to add to the practicality of, you know, no-till, a lot of people think starting a farm you need big machinery and that's a really big cost. And to think that you can just do everything by hand, I mean, we started using the walk-behind tractor for mowing down crops and kind of like, previously we were cutting it at soil level, taking it out to our compost pile, but we realized you can just mow it down and let that sort of compost in place, which is really cool. Um, and become, you know, mulch if it's you know, heavy enough. Um, but other than that, we don't use the tractor in our field and it just speaks to, you know, how um, accessible it is for young people to start, even just starting a farm, you know. I, I think that it just minimizes one of those big obstacles. Right, so we are soil farmers. That's, that's what we are. The, the vegetables are just a side effect of that. We're constantly feeding our soil and the soil is growing our vegetables. And the plants can access certain nutrients by themselves. So it's a combination of bacterial and fungal life that is creating this economy underground. They're trading carbon and sugars and they're breaking down complex nutrients and things that plants can absorb. So by feeding our soil, keeping our biology really high, um, every year it's getting a little bit easier because the plants are having what they need. They're healthy, they can fight off pests, and they taste better, they last longer, they look better. Um, so it's, yeah, going organic, um, doing it at our scale, doing no-till, all these things, they seem alien and they seem like a lot of work. And it is a lot of work up front, but then once you have that life in your farm, it just continues. Our next stop is the farm in Woodbury. Old-fashioned agricultural principles and modern technology help make the farm a special place for all in southern Litchfield County. Their CSA program is a cornerstone of the community, and we had to see it for ourselves. The diverse range of crops that they produce and events they hold are something you have to see firsthand to truly take in. Where can you find a sustainable food supply and perfect family experience for all? Well, at the farm. My name is Stephen Perez. I'm here at the farm in Woodbury, Connecticut, and I'm the field crop manager. We grow a lot of crops from pretty much from cucumbers, pickles, winter squash, summer squash, sweet corn, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, and also greens um, through the whole summer. I like the change of things from season to season. I like seeing things go from bare soil to finished crop. So the whole growing process, really, I enjoy doing. Uh, the goal to what we do is to grow food to feed the community um, in a sustainable way and also support our family while doing it. We started at a farm that my father started to rent in the late 80s. Um, I've been doing this since since I was born pretty much, so I've never really done anything different. Uh, and we just, me and my brothers have been building the business ever since. We took over, I don't know, it had to be almost 20 years ago, started taking over a little bit more at a time. So it developed over time, and uh, recently we were able to purchase this 55-acre farm here in Woodbury after our hard work, so it's just neat to see it grow. We each have our specialty. I handle the field crops. My brother Ben handles pretty much a lot of the same stuff with me, oversee the greenhouses and the maple syrup, and everything's seasonal. So as we go from season to season, it's easier to kind of keep track of it. So we're always doing something every season, and it's not necessarily the same thing. Sometimes they overlap a little bit, but we... We've been handling it for years. So, Well, recently we've added um, this year, actually, the sunflowers, um, which is brings people to the farm, brings customers in to see our produce and everything else, and it also gets people out in the air. Um, that's one thing that we've done to try to be more sustainable as far as the farm goes. Uh, also, the corn maze is, is in its second year, um, and that is also another big draw in the fall to help bring people in to see the other crops that we are bringing in the fall winter squash, pumpkins, tomatoes, stuff that's just about at its end. And the winter squash, you know, just keep going right through a year. But, uh, so, stuff like that, just to change the diversity of everything. A lot of things that drove that, we worked with uh, Yukon Extension for four years. Um, so that helped us uh, get a better idea of and an understanding of what we're doing. Um, but before that, even just basic soil health was one of the main things. Because without healthy soil, the pH isn't right, you can't grow healthy produce. 
so that was a main main driver also. Uh, it's definitely going to be something that's necessary. Uh, it's not easy to do, but it needs to be done because you can see the way things have been going lately. If there's food shortages and you have to truck your food halfway across the country, and why can't we grow it here? So if you can grow it here, it's a lot less of an impact it's going to have on the consumer. Um, because it's here already. You don't have to worry about trucking or if something happens in California, you get a hurricane or, or whatever and it knocks out crop, we'll have it here. So it's like a backup plan. Have a plan, talk to people who are in the business already and see what their challenges are and then try to learn a little bit from everyone and put it together and make it work. That's really it. You learn something new every day because conditions change, crop conditions change, everything, everything is variable in what we do. So you have to kind of tweak the crop um, to the weather really. So if you need certain things in certain weather conditions, you change that. And being the way we grow on plastic with drip tape on a lot of the crops that we grow, a lot of the vegetable crops, we have better control on moisture and crop nutrients that we put in the soil. Um, well, we just recently added the farm stand here at the farm, um, actually last year, and it's definitely helped because you drag people in from different areas because our other farm store is well, four or five miles from here. In just that short amount of distance, you see a different crowd, and it's amazing to see. Come out to the farm and take a tour, walk around and see what's here and get a better understanding. That's really it. Talk to someone who grows food. It's the best way to get a handle on how it's happening. It doesn't just happen at the store. It doesn't grow on the shelf. <laughs>
economically, um, in order for us to be sustainable in this climate, um, with with all these different things that are changing around us, it's required that we diversify. And that is why we have a farm market and garden center on this farm property. And that is why we are making cow pots using our cow's manure because we couldn't support the members of this family with just a single income stream. And that's kind of become the standard for most dairy farms all across New England and probably across of this country is that you've got to utilize what other resources you have access to. Sustainable agriculture on this farm would be defined as being able to make sure that what we're doing today ensures and preserves our ability to do it again next year, and the year after that, and the year after that. That we are not uh, extracting resources, leaving us limited for the years ahead. That in fact, we are making things better. It's kind of like the Girl Scout rule of conduct. I mean, that was always my mom's deal was we left a space cleaner than we found it. And so we're going to leave this land more um, uh, more ready and prepared to feed the next generation. Farmers are not shy about sharing their their successes and their failures. I mean, that's that's kind of a, a core to what we do and who we are. We we like to talk about you know what works and what doesn't work. And so we posted a lot of farmers here. Um, we were the first farm in the state to put robotic milkers in. And so there's been a lot of people that have come through this barn because they want to know how is it going? What was that transition like? Because they're they're kind of putting their feelers out there because maybe they want to invest in the same thing. So we are an open book and I think a lot of other farms are too about um, always inviting other people to, to participate. And even if that means a little bit of competition, um, I think it's healthy competition. There is an incredibly bright future for agriculture. I mean, it's things are changing. It's not gonna be like it was 10 years ago, but I mean, it doesn't have to just be being on the farm. When I think about the number of people that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, we are working with folks that are focused on genetics. We do genomic testing on every single animal in this barn. We are working with folks that are specifically looking at cow comfort and cow stress, nutrition, I mean, so whether you feel like you want to be in it, I mean, literally putting boots on every day and going out into the barn, I mean, find a farmer and go and learn from them and be part of that operation that's currently working um, before you think that you're just going to buy up a piece of land and put a barn on it and start farming. Like that's not, there's so much intellectual knowledge that's available in this town, in this state, like you can find some incredible human resources to be able to understand how to get into farming. But don't think that you, the only door open to you in agriculture is physically being on a farm. So, I mean, there's so much you can do in agriculture. You don't have to be a farmer, but you certainly can be. Um, but there's, there's, there's so much, so much, whether it be with animals, with science, with crops, with soil, fully smokes. In a world where medicine was prescribed by physicians we never knew, our trust in medicine would be questioned and our overall health would be a product of guesswork. Our food system should be no different. There must be a sense of trust between all consumers and producers in order to bridge the disconnect within this industry that used to be in the backyard of every family. Every generation is further removed from the farm and therefore less aware of the food production system. Throughout Connecticut, producers are working day and night to ensure that their consumers can put a face and family to their food. By providing us with nutritious, locally grown products, our farms are connecting everyone to agriculture again. Our state is poised to move into an agricultural system without guessing and only answers. Connecticut is conveniently situated between Boston and New York City, meaning that we always have people who want to get away from the city and eat food that they can put a face to. Stone Gardens and Shelton does this every day. Fred, Sasha, and Tommy are excellent teachers, and that is why they always help their customers understand agriculture from seed to sale. For us to highlight consumer-producer relationships at work, we look no further than Stone Gardens Farm. Hi.
mother stopped on my hand. Um, my husband, Fred, and our son, Tommy, which is from Garden Farm. Tomatoes, corn, here on the tomatoes, Brussels sprouts, peppers, all kinds of peppers, all kinds of things. Summer squash. We also have a lot of variety of meat, really meat, pork, chicken. 14 years old, I started working for Shelton's Dairy. There will be milk cow, bottled milk, pasteurized, and commoditized liver to pork pork. And that's when I started messing around with a little bit of sweet pork. It's made. We've got a house to eat Shelton's Dairy here in Shelton, where we're now working with Tom and Fred. And I'm just really Gary and decided to start a vegetable farm. We started off with a little table out front, just now, up in the vegetable field, actually. We started the CSA program, but that's very rigid, very recommended. You're getting what we're telling you you're going to take. So we had a lot of people saying, well, I'm only a single person. I can't take that much. I travel a lot for business. Is there something else we can do? And that was the other option to come up with, okay, well, we can do a prepaid program for you, and then you can choose anything you want. Now we have um, quite a few people who use the farm credit as a permit. It's almost a full permit of CSA program for them. The first thing is when they walk in the door, you greet them by name. Even if they only come back in the summer for corn and vegetables, or their year round weekly shopping customer, um, Greet them when they come in the door. Even if you don't know their name, you know something that they like to buy. And you remember, oh, hey, this wasn't in stock last time, but we've got it back now. Or, hey, why don't you try this? I think you'll really like it. It's really similar to something else that you like. Just starting to um, recognize your customers and remember some of them. And even when you have somebody who's new in the stand, and you're having that kind of conversation with a regular older customer in the stand, the new people start to feel more at home. They start to feel more welcome because you're having such a, you have such a great relationship with the other customers who are already in the stand. They're like, oh, this is a place that I want to shop at because it's like home. There's a lot of science when I grow with food and grow with no idea. No idea. The knowledge that goes into growing. I mean, we learn every day. You know, you put a tomato plant in your yard, and they get three tomatoes, and then they're complaining about the bugs, or complaining about the fungus. Well, yeah, because you have to know what you're doing to grow. The cost that goes into everything is not just what you're paying for your seed, there's your spray, there's your time, there's your practice cost, there's a lot of other costs that go into it. I just put papers in. I'm in the best I'm 21 years old, so I grew up in the best of the So I, I grew up throughout the whole thing. So just walking through the best of the field, my parents and whatnot, the tomatoes, and the cucumber, and being able to pick off a tomato or see it right there, and the cucumber, and the you know, it's just a food supply for us, even without having people buy it or sell it to it. But they, they, they like it. Is knowing it. They um, we can provide food for other people, but just ourselves, and having that, just watching life happen that way, very rewarding. And I guess challenging, everything's challenging. It, it's, it's the way you, you look at it, you know? You wake up in the morning and you just do what has to be done, whether it's water pump breaking or all semester, or the hurricane last week, all the corn on the ground. Some people are going to consider that a lost crop and claim insurance on it, but corn's still there, it still has to be picked. People are going to still come in tomorrow and look, look for the corn. You can't just say that, sorry, it's gone. One of his teachers, when he was young, said, keep that kid interested in the farm because that's all he talks about. So that was it. <laughs> <laughs>
one valuable lesson at a time. My name is Deborah Gregg, and I am the farm director at Common Ground High School and the New Haven Ecology Project. We're based here in West Rock Park, which is sort of on the edge of New Haven. Common Ground itself is a nonprofit and a charter school. So the Common Ground Farm um, is a production farm, even though we're fairly small, from three quarters of an acre. So we produce food for um, the high school cafeteria, for our farm stand. We have a small farm share for students and families in the spring and the fall. And we run a mobile market, um, which goes around neighborhoods in New Haven that don't have access to fresh, affordable, locally grown produce. In addition to being a sort of small production farm, we also do a lot of education. I started farming when I was in college, so I I grew up in New York, and the school that I went to had a farm. I got involved because I was interested in alternative education, and I got a job there um, designing curriculum one summer, and I just sort of fell in love myself and felt at, at peace when I was out in the fields. And then I also really loved being able to talk to um, young folks who were also from the city um, that was like, very close to the farm. This job came up, and I was like, I can't. I can't not apply for it. Like, I gotta do it now, I guess. <laughs> um, so that's how I came here. So it's been almost four years. It's been great. Yeah. Food justice is bigger than just food. It helps connect young people to themselves in a very powerful way. Their families, their history, the land that we're on, which is UPF land, and gain sort of an understanding of how food impacts their lives and helps them feel that they can make informed choices. So we actually have a food justice education coordinator. She works with um, our young people to um, create agency with within the work that we do. So for example, she's working on our farm to school program um, and the way that she's working on it is not only engaging with the cafeteria and the chef in the cafeteria around sourcing from the farm or um, adjusting recipes to reflect what's in season, um, but she runs a cooking club with students where they choose recipes from either their own um, backgrounds or from around the world, um, a different food that they want to explore, and then they test out the recipe in their club, and then they do a taste test in the cafeteria, so they feel empowered to encourage their fellow students to just taste something new and try something new and connect to a way that it might connect to themselves. My name is Jalen Johnson. I'm an alum here and a rising senior at UConn, studying social work, and I'm an intern at the farm. And the reason I love, love the farm, it's just, it's like raising a kid without the talk thing. <laughs> the same thing with the sheep and the goat. It's like, yes, I get to nurture you and raise you, and I get to see my product, but sometimes the talk back is disease, <laughs> and like pests, and then it's just like, oh, I worked so hard on you, and now you're failing me. If a child who has trouble in school is able to take responsibility over a plant, then that they could translate that to their own life in school. Like, oh, if I could take care of this plant, I guess I can do my homework. I just took care of a living thing, and now I got this fruit to feed my family and show them, like, look how good it tastes. Look what I did. It's also helping people of color connect back to their roots. Like, that's also why I like farming, because then I just think my grandfather on my dad's side, his they were like sharecroppers. But now I think of myself as like, he didn't have a choice to do that, but now I have a choice and I'm gonna make like a good part of it. I'm gonna share it with the community. I'm gonna use my resources as a woman in 2020 and not in 1920 to do this and have a choice to do this and do it right. So you're not gonna reach someone by just telling them about how exciting an apple is and putting a poster in a cafeteria. But I think by taking multiple approaches, you're kind of encountering someone in different ways multiple times. So I think with our students and families in particular, we definitely are very lucky because we're embedded in an educational environment, but you know, not only do we have food that we're producing and sending home with students and families, but we're also able to um, 
talk to them in depth about it. I think some of it too is working with the young people, right? Like if you have a young person who's selling at a farm stand and is excited to talk about the food that's there and um, share that story, I think that's really exciting for a customer. They're seeing um, sort of the next generation show their passion. We wanted to continue our journey of how education was playing a critical role in consumer connection, so we decided that there was no better of a place to go to than our farm, the state's 4-H Educational Center in Bloomfield, Connecticut. Connecting youth to agriculture is perhaps the best thing we could do for the future generations. Educating people with hands-on skills in the fields of agriculture, natural resources, nutrition, and animal welfare will only benefit everyone, and we we had to see this process transpire at our farm. So I'm Erica Fern. I'm the executive director of the 4-H Education Center at Our Farm. Welcome to Our Farm. Our goal here is to educate the public and the youth and give them a connection between agriculture, nature, and our environment. So we try to connect the youth and the adults with our food system starting at the farm level. So Our Farm has a number of roles in the community. We have a 4-H education program, which is our 4-H club. We have about 40 4-Hers that come to the farm every other Saturday. They work with livestock from rabbits, chickens, alpacas, sheep. We have beef cattle and we have a dairy cow that belongs to one of our 4-Hers. So we work with the youth in our community in that way. We also have a food share garden that is run by our Master Gardener program. And all the food produced in the food share garden goes directly to food share and they raise ethnic vegetables so people of all different cultures that utilize food share have something that they're familiar with to eat and put on their table. It's extremely important that people today of all ages know where their food comes from and makes that connection. We have a severe disparity in our country of food security. People do not know that they will have food on their table. Food comes from the grocery store. If the grocery store is out of food, what happens then? And that creates an unknown stress that we don't see every day in our lives, but it's there in the back of our head. It's very important that people understand the value of agriculture. There's been so many myths about large agriculture, big agriculture, corporate agriculture. Here at our farm, we grow our food sustainably. We're working really hard to put a food system together where we produce the food, we serve it to people, they buy the produce or it goes to food share. The food waste from the restaurants and Healing Meals, who is here, goes into our Black Soldier Fly program where they compost the food and then that Black Soldier Fly, the maggots that result from that are fed to our chickens and that goes back into the cycle. And then the waste is very high in carbon, and so we're working on pelletizing that waste with beef matter and using that to heat our greenhouse in the winter. It is scientifically proven that being outside does something really great for your brain. When I first came to our farm, I was told about this magical experience. And it's very hard to put into words until you've actually been here or on another farm and just experience that you can just let go. Our students need that. When we look at the stress that we're seeing in our students of all ages, even adults of all ages, being part of the farm, getting back to the basics of where food production comes from, where animal production comes from, just gives an overall sense of well-being and security that students don't get everywhere else. They also have a role in helping our world become a better place with, a, say for instance, a pollinator project. We have so many pollinators here on the farm. That's something that schools can do in their own schoolyard, is have a pollinator garden. They can have some experiential learning outside the connection between the consumer and the farmer is very important. 
And I always felt growing up, I was one of the most shy people ever. And I gravitated towards the livestock because I didn't have to talk to people, or it gave me a way to talk to people through 4-H, through the University of Connecticut. It made that connection for me where I was more comfortable. I often thought that people get into agriculture because we're really not people people, right? We wanna go out, we wanna work with the land, we wanna do our thing. And I think the hardest thing for our farmers is they go seven days a week, 12, 15 hours a day. Mother Nature comes in, takes all their plans, twists them up, spits them out, and they have so much to deal with on a day-to-day -day level that it's oftentimes difficult for a farmer to take a deep breath and say, how do I talk to my customer? How do I make them welcome at my farm with all the other liabilities that I need to worry about and help them understand agriculture. How as a farmer do I help them understand agriculture? I anticipate that our farm helps the local farmers do that by letting us educate the public about agriculture. So that when the consumer goes to the local farm, they understand a little more about what's really happening there. Because there's so much disconnect that consumers don't understand and farmers don't understand that the consumers don't understand. So I think it's just step by step, taking the time to do a little bit of education every day that you're on your farm. As our farm showed us the importance of educating people, we wanted to circle back to the producer's point of view. It was important to understand how our farmers are making sure their consumers are feeling heard and valued. We headed east to North Franklin to visit Mackenzie at Arrowhead Acres to see how she always looks to make her customers feel involved and connected to the farm. Our goal is to capture how farms are direct advocates for every customer that stops by, and Arrowhead Acres helped us better understand that concept. I'm Mackenzie, and this is Arab Hankers, and I'm the owner and manager here. So we try and have a little bit of something for everyone. We grow a variety of different things. I do strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, different kinds of vegetables. We have vineyard, um, the grapes that we do with wine. And then we also have a bakery. So we bake all of our own baked goods here, all from scratch. And then the winery, we make all the wine here as well. So I went to UConn and I was a horticulture major and at the time I, the land wasn't being used for anything, this building was empty, I was fortunate enough to have the space and I basically got to decide what I wanted to grow and how I wanted to sell it. Um, so there are a lot of options but I ended up deciding on starting with berries was the big one. The grapes were always in the plan but I knew they would take a little longer. I decided on those because at the time, um, I was still in school, I was looking for something that I knew would grow well in the area that I had. At first it was, those were a, kind of an early summer to mid-season kind of crop and like I said I was still in school at the time so I'd be going back in the fall, I wanted something I could do for the summer. Um, and I personally, those are some of my favorites. The barn and the lands that were here, originally it was a dairy farm and it was a livestock option and that closed when I was younger. I was looking for something that was a little more, I don't want to say modern, but things that people were looking to go do, people were looking for and that we didn't necessarily have in, um, in this exact area. Um, so the grapes and the wine is something I was really interested in. There's a lot of science involved in it, but also being outdoors. Um, and I knew that was something that, you know, wineries are popular these days. And I had the ability to do it, so might as well give it a shot. Um, and like for the strawberries, there's not that many other strawberry growers right around here. Um, so it was another small market that I could get into that I thought would do pretty well and we just kind of keep evolving as we find out what people, are, what people want, what people are looking for. We actually do a lot with customer feedback and I am usually, I'm happy to take suggestions um, and there's been some really good ones and things we've tried, some that for logistical reasons aren't quite there, but um, for example in the bakery. 
when we first started out, things really started taking off. We had a lot of people asking for lunch type foods. And we like, alright, we'll give it a try. We started doing soups and sandwiches. And now that's one of our busiest times of day. And it's been going really well. So it was a great suggestion. Um, we're trying to do things that people were looking for. So in the winter, say, for example, it slows down quite a bit. So we started doing craft nights and we started a wine and book club. And same thing, it was people were excited about it, it gives people another reason to come out. Um, but we like the suggestions. We won't always won't always use them, but it never hurts. So my ideas are always kind of constantly evolving. Um, I always try and have like a five-year plan and try and get to get to that point. Um, so I follow a, a bit of a goal line there, but I again I alter it as I feel like it needs to. So if um, one area, I guess if we have a couple different areas of business: the bakery, the winery, the farm part. So if something needs a little little boost or a little change, um, I can see it as it comes and kind of evolve where we need to. So it's constantly changing, but always heading in basically the same direction. What do you find is your best seller in your bakery? Ooh, uh, that one is probably a toss up between chocolate chip cookies. Um, those are definitely a top seller. Um, we do a lot of things seasonally, so uh, in the fall, like apple pie is probably top. We do a lot of different apple based things. Um, whoopie pies? I was kind of surprised at that one, but those are, we go through those quick. Um, those are probably the, probably the top three, I'd say. Change is certain inevitable, and ultimately good. It shows resilience when facing obstacles and uncommon occurrences. Only the most dedicated and innovative among us are ready to face such challenges and come out stronger than ever. Our producers here in Connecticut face challenges every day. Numerous issues with weather, time, and financial strain. Yet no challenge is as great as meeting the constantly changing needs of the consumer. Through critical thinking and determination, our farmers must alter what they do and the services that they provide all the time in order to keep their customers happy and more people knocking on the door. By incorporating various markets under the umbrella of agritourism, our farms and farm families bring us weddings, flower picking, pumpkin mazes, and so much more. With change being the only truth in everyday life, in agriculture. Our producers are doing everything that they can to keep up with the times and prosper. Our farms provide a lot of commodities, events, and products throughout Connecticut, and they contribute to the amazing diversity of our agricultural industry. March Farm has been a Bethlehem gem since 1915 and has brought everything to the hills of the Christmas town. As the agricultural industry changes, so do our farms and March Farm has always been a step ahead of the crowd. In order for us to capture the diversity and ingenuity of Connecticut producers, we had to pay a visit to Munger Lane in Bethlehem. My name is Heather Hurley. I um, was born and raised on our family farm here, March Farms in Bethlehem, Connecticut. We grow um, a multitude of fruits and vegetables. We start things in greenhouses, and everything then is moved outside. Uh, we have a pick your own oper operation, as well as um, multiple events that can go on throughout the year. We didn't start as a very diverse operation. Uh, when I was growing up, it was primarily a dairy farm with some apple trees. Well, we got rid of the cows in 87, and we started putting green out with them. 1958. I became a landowner because I was interested in the farm and then I gave, well we had four kids and I gave each one of them an acre and a half. In the early 80s, um, a lot of the dairy farms in Connecticut were going under. We kind of had the orchards to fall back on. Um, and at that point, we started to add greenhouses to the production. That enabled us to have um, vegetables early 
earlier than people would be growing them in their own gardens. More recently, probably within the last uh, 10 years, it's kind of become a destination where people, um, you know, they come for the day. It gives somebody, it gives families a um, a nice place to go. We, we get a lot of people coming in from Fairfield County, a lot of people that come in from the city um, that are just not used to a country style uh, or lifestyle. So it gives them an opportunity just to kind of spend a day in the country um, and it's affordable. You know, if you if I went to bring my family of five to a baseball game, I'm going to drop probably, you know, hundreds of dollars where I can come here and I can pack a picnic lunch and I can pick a few apples and listen to some music and it's um, way more reasonable and people are just looking for, you know, family oriented things to do that are not going to break the bank. When was the farm um, willing to get into events and weddings? What made you guys go into that? Um, my brother who passed away last October, um, that was all of his idea. Um, he saw an opportunity, he saw a beautiful setting and a beautiful view, and he worked very hard to get it on the map for weddings, um, and, and he did. So, um, and again, I think it was just another way to make some extra income to ensure that you could get through, you know, winters or get through seasons that crops were a failure, or um, and, and just have it be able to continue going. What is the most rewarding part of having a farm, and especially a production farm? Seeing the crops. Like, I love planting corn, planting pumpkins, seeing it grow, being able to take the kids on my little buggy, my go buggy, I call it, and we go out and look at the crops on rides at night, watching them pick the corn, just being able to take a tiny little seed and then take something from that and then put something back in too. My wife actually got me Audible on my phone so I've been listening to books and farming books and most of it is, is um, you know, regenerative ag and stuff like that so it really got my attention. And I listened to a book by Gabe Brown called Dirty Soil and then the wheels started spinning. Ideas may be different and things may be done differently than they were done before, but that's okay. You know, farmers are very much year after year the same thing over and over and over again. And it's okay to have uh, different things happening and going about them in different ways. Imagine a vacation that allows you to be around animals, nature, and embrace a little hard work, like an Airbnb on a farm. Barry and Nancy Kaplan, owners of Bushmeadow Farm and Union, have had this idea from the beginning, embracing the concept of rigid flexibility to ensure their operation was always a unique New England experience. Bushmeadow Farm is an oasis of ideas at work. To grasp the idea of what it means to be a unique operation, we headed to the sparsely populated Union, Connecticut, to pay the Kaplans a visit. I'm Barry Kaplan. My name is Nancy Kaplan. My wife and I own and operate Bush Meadow Farm in Union, Connecticut. Uh, the focus of our farm and business plan uh, is to increase uh, sustainability uh, and to provide a holistic approach uh, to farming in a total life cycle type of situation. So not only do we produce livestock and poultry, large and small fruits, but one of the main focuses of our farm is ag tourism and everything that goes along with it, from hospitality to food service to lodging. Here we are on 37 acres of property and what was important I think for us was giving our children space to um, be outside to experience things. But we started with some goats um, because we had the time and we had people start coming to our door and it was like, will you sell the goat milk? And of course, well, we can't sell the goat milk because we're not licensed dairy. You know, and I started doing some research into the benefits and health benefits of goats. And so from that, we segued into the goat dairy. 
we started with the cheeses and we had the milk and then we started with the yogurts and it, we just found that people were coming in and they wanted the connection with their food. They wanted to know, you know, that milk came from that doe who's out there and look at how healthy she looks and she's got this beautiful green field. Weddings and events uh, through family members getting married and things, it, it seems to always be a very, very intense, very um, structured, very rigid type of uh, package that you get. And when you come to the farm, what you get is the opportunity to breathe, to take that breath and just relax into that moment and into the space and create something that's unique to you and your spouse or your soon-to-be spouse. What we, we support is a three-day event here on the farm. We have different areas on the farm for your ceremony. So maybe you have your rehearsal here on the farm and then, you know, it's a beautiful summer day. So let's have our rehearsal dinner out in the field and let's do a barbecue and let's just really, really have a good time with maybe a volleyball mat. The next morning you get up and let's say somebody wants to take a hike at the little hollow. You know, somebody wants to go um, fishing. You know, we have so many things in this northeast corner that allow people to connect with the earth. Maybe you want to do hair and makeup and sit at a high bar table and just be outside and, and just enjoy it. So you have so many opportunities to create something that's very, very special and very unique to you. One of the things that we did when we operated our Plow to Plate farm store and restaurant, Plow to Plate being we grow it, we process it, we cook it, or uh, value add to it, and we serve it. The Plow to Plate concept that we're talking about is something unique and different. It is inclusive so when you marry the plow to plate into our all demographic inclusive agriculture model we focus on children we focus on young families we focus on millennials we focus on elders to bring them in and show them how our form of agriculture here in southern new england and particularly connecticut impacts their daily life and when we make that connection that's when we win. to remain relevant you have to remain current just because my grandfather and my father did it that way does not mean that a v8 engine using leaded gas is the way to go today in 2020. just like we've improved our ecology, we improve air quality, we have to change with the times. Rigid flexibility is a concept that take advantage and exploit the crisis of the day to make lemonade out of it. The most rewarding is the smiles on the young children over here because they're, they're learning something about agriculture. They're learning about something that connects them back to the land. Uh, something that connects them back to the, uh, the lineage of, of their own families. You know, they've heard, oh, great granddad was raised on a farm in upstate New York. Well, now he knows what a farm can look like. It's just the farm's on its journey. You know, it's still speaking to us. It is still um, every day a revelation of where we're supposed to go. After our time with the Kaplans in Union, we headed back to the fertile and populated Connecticut River Valley. For our final stop on this journey, we were lucky enough to visit Podunk Popcorn and Zen Tree Farm in South Windsor. John and Dan Zen are the definition of savvy New Englanders who seek to make the best even better. Our goal was to find farms that embraced forward thinking and always enhance their customers' experience. On Barber Hill Road in South Windsor, we found a perfect match. So I'm Dan Zen. I'm the fourth generation of the Zen family to be involved in farming here in South Windsor. Um, I own Podunk Popcorn, which is a small gourmet popcorn growing operation. And... Um, Part of Zen Tree Farm as well. Uh, we 
grow our Christmas trees for choose and cut your own and pre-cut. Um, we have our own reindeer, Santa and Mrs. Claus, and a gift shop, a cafe. Uh, it started when I was in high school in the FFA program at Rockville High School. Um, I wanted to prove myself as someone that could run my own farm business. Growing up in a farm family, you're given many opportunities to be involved, but not necessarily to say that you started something. That's really where I wanted to uh, kind of spread my own wings and grow a different crop that was completely different from the family. It actually uh, it kind of started out backwards from the way most people do it. Um, I was given a piece of equipment by a, a friend of the family, a small uh, one row corn planter. And um, he knew that I was interested in growing something. So this planter had many different uh, seed attachments and I didn't really know what to grow. And so I started growing sweet corn. After three years of failing miserably at that, uh, my dad said, well, why don't you try popcorn? When I was a kid, I used to grow some. So of course, you know, any high schooler says, well, if my dad did it, I can definitely do it better. So I planted a half an acre and it sold like crazy. Food in Connecticut does taste better. Um, it's not sitting on a truck and being sent halfway across the country, three quarters away across the country. We grow things here that just taste better. Um, it's important to sell ourselves as local, but it's also important to explain why local is better. And, and it's because it is fresh. It's grown by your neighbors. We all have a financial interest to grow safe food here in Connecticut because these are our neighbors. And if we don't have our neighbors buying our products, then who will? Nobody. So we have to try really hard to make sure that that's, um, you know, uh, food quality and food safety is, is kept really high. But I think farmers in Connecticut have to be adaptable to change. Um, I know that us farmers are typically traditionalists, but in order to survive in this day and age of social media and the internet, we have to be constantly looking for ways to improve. I think patience is a big thing. We all have tight time goals and we want things done as soon as possible, especially people of my generation, our generation. You know, it's, uh, it's tough because we're so used to it. We want everything right now and that doesn't always happen. Um, and being patient, flexible, and, and just riding the wave. We all have a plan when we start, but things are gonna change along the way and being you know, adaptable and willing to uh, adjust course, I think is really important. Change comes hard. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Uh, so we have struggled over the years to go new places. Um, uh, we tend to over-research new projects. We tend to um, go and visit people that have successfully done it and, and try to avoid some mistakes by learning from their success. Um, change is a difficult thing to embrace and what's put us in the, the forefront of the Christmas tree industry in Connecticut is that ability to change and, and not be afraid to try a few things and try and get ahead of the curve a little bit. That's really put us on the map. We're doing very well, don't get me wrong. We are truly blessed. But I want to know what we're doing tomorrow. I want to know what we're doing next year. I want to know, um, I've always taught my children that if you're not moving forward, then you're moving backwards. So we need to continue to push the envelope of where we are, where we're going, how we're reaching people, how we're meeting people's needs. If we don't get out ahead of that, then we just become a you know, just a plain Christmas tree farm. Uh, we want to be a destination. Our little tagline that's on all of our apparel and, and all of our you know, printed ads, website, social media, everything, is where family traditions are made. And we're at the point now where we're into the third and fourth generation of families coming back to us. I have the coolest job in the world, bar none. You come and you get to hang out with my family. You choose a tree. You choose the best tree you can find. You take it home. You put it in your favorite room. The best tree, the favorite room. You only invite your favorite family to sit in your best room around the best tree. And, and you serve a special meal. I got the coolest job ever. We get to be part of your celebration of the birth of baby Jesus. The, the coolest thing for me, yesterday, we had three young couples get engaged on the farm. To me, that's breathtaking. Somehow or another, we have touched these three lives far enough where some guy with a ring decided to hang out with me. That's like the coolest thing ever. We've never done three in one day. That was yesterday's record. It's, it's really, it's breathtaking. It really is. So one of the farms that I was able to rent to start growing popcorn on, an uh, older gentleman approached me and offered it to me because he knew I was a young farmer getting started in the area. And just making the community aware of your intentions and what you're trying to do, I think is huge. And just building relationships. If you see somebody in the coffee shop that's got 
a pickup truck labeled with so-and-so farm, introduce yourself, say hello. Um, and I, I think the relationships are really important. I think the other thing too is um, trying to keep humility in mind. We all want to build something big and massive, but um, as a friend told me once, keep it small and keep it all. So now that you've traveled with us around the Nutmeg State and seen the diversity that comes from these fields, cared for by our dedicated producers, we hope it showed you their devotion to sustainability, their passion for education, and their ability to adapt so that they may put a healthy variety of nutritious food on our plates and making themselves stewards of the land and commissioners of conservation. Our state's producers are altering their methods to prevent environmental degradation in order to create a more sustainable food supply. By utilizing social media and new technology, our farmers have become advocates for consumer education. For bridging the gap between consumers and producers, they are putting a face to food. Showing everyone that the farmers are a vital part of our community. When faced with an ever-changing market, Connecticut producers are dynamic enough to meet the ever-changing demand. That's the way we did it for years, is a saying of the past. As for the future, our farmers will embrace the mindset of rigid flexibility. This is the state of Connecticut. This is our food. This is our future. This is completely Connecticut. agriculture.